Christmas, everybody. It's Allie, and welcome to our Y&R chat for Sunday, December 25th, 2022. Nothing says Merry Christmas like a briefcase full of money. <laughs> And we are not talking duffel bag cash here. We're talking tan leather briefcase full of money. <laughs> That's the classy way to pay someone off. You do it in leather. <laughs> And, and, Jack told us how much money was in the briefcase. Half a million dollars. Yes. And, not for nothing, Jeremy took the money out of the briefcase and he flipped through some of the bills, really giving me that tactile sensation. That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's the holiday spirit in Genoa City. Cold hard cash. <laughs> ah, well, Sherlock Ashley figured out that Diane hadn't really fled town. And if Ashley could figure it out, I'm surprised that Jeremy couldn't. But it's Christmas time. And Sentimental Jack is feeling extra sentimental. Ashley was kind of questioning his fundamental judgment because of his attitude toward Diane. And Kyle was really, really longing to spend Christmas with his mommy. <laughs> so what is a sentimental old fool like Jack to do? Lead the killer right to the cabin? No! That's the surprising part. That was what I thought was going to happen. Instead, though, Jack goes to Jeremy's hotel room with a briefcase of cash and offers for him to just take the cash and go away forever. But Jeremy seemed to snatch the upper hand away from Jack at first. Jeremy said, okay, first of all, half a million ain't enough. <laughs> he just sneezed at that half a million dollar offer. But second of all, Jeremy said, I got some questions for Diane. I need to see her one more time. I need to ask her what I need to ask her. And then I'll think about naming my prize. So... Jack, when I thought he was going to be stupid and take, take Jeremy up to the cabin, no, he led Jeremy on a wild goose chase, pretending, just pretending to look for Diane, and then also pretending to be furious when he couldn't find her. All the while, Jack brilliantly was able to buy time for Kyle and Summer and Harrison to make it up to the cabin to put the star on top of the Christmas tree. How lovely was that? How lovely was it to actually see the Abbott cabin and the area outside the front door? Oh, that felt, it just felt good to be in that cabin at Christmas time. I hope that we get to see a little bit more of it before everything's over. I don't think it is over. In the end, Jeremy decided that he would let Jack double the offer. He would take a million dollars to be done with chasing Diane. And it seemed like game, set, match. Jack Abbott is the winner. I don't know, though. I don't know. There's got to be more to it. But either way, gosh, this is the best that Jack has been in so long. In all of these scenes with Diane and Ashley and Jeremy, I am seeing a 
fire in his eyes that I haven't seen in so long. And every time I see Jack lately, I feel reminded of all the reasons why I love Y&R. It just takes me right back to my youth watching Jack's big blue eyes burn with passion about something. Guys, I can't believe I'm about to say this, <laughs> but I need to see a Tucker Sharon hookup. <laughs> Speaking of fire, Tucker and Sharon's scene together had more fire than I have seen out of Sharon in years. <sighs> he really got up under her skin, didn't he? <laughs> she was fiery and feisty and sexy. You know, it was like for a minute, Counselor Sharon, the Sharon that gives everybody a second chance and wants to help everybody, just flew right out the window. Tucker just brought out the drama in her again. Oh. She had his number almost immediately. She doubted his get good quick story. She doubted his intentions toward Ashley. And she probably overspiced his coffee too. <laughs> and he deserved it. How dare he make her defend her own coffee shop? <laughs> he sort of was talking down to her like, okay, well, how's your little life? Here at Crimson Lights, as if serving the community with fake plastic cinnamon rolls isn't as important as corporate espionage. <laughs> we need both. Okay, Tucker, we need both. Oh, just And the way he was sort of insulting her and she was sort of insulting him, she was giving so many faces and... She looked so sexy with her hair down and it was kind of swooped over to one side. I I don't know. I want to see this Sharon more often. That's what I know. I want to see this Sharon more often. Often, And if we're screen testing Tucker, if all of this is about kind of getting a sense of who he might be a good romantic pair with, this one gets my vote. Sharon and Tucker. There was just something there. Oh. What, I don't know where that leaves Audra. I feel like Audra's out in the cold on all of this. Why is nobody in love with little lost girl Audra? It's like Noah doesn't want her. Tucker seems only to want to sleep with her, and then he shoves her into the bathroom when Ashley shows up, or she chose. I don't. I don't know what the dynamic is. I'm not sure. Is Tucker into? Audra and they just have an understanding that he is using Ashley and she's just Audra just dealing with it to get to the greater goal or does Tucker really have feelings for Ashley and he's just ugh, friends with benefits taking a little piece with Audra on the side I don't know but I loved the anticipation of whether or not Ashley was going to discover Audra in Tucker's hotel room. But I have to say, Tucker did do a pretty brilliant job of flushing Ashley away. Did you notice that? He started saying things that he knew would be a turnoff for her so that she would, you know, not <laughs> end up walking through that hotel room door. He said, oh, I was just about to take a shower and he actually offered to let her come in and shower with him, knowing that Audra was hiding in the bathroom. It was so risky. But that's who Tucker is. What did, what did they say was on his business card a couple of weeks ago? Something like professional upsetter. I don't remember what it was, but it just it definitely describes him. He knew Audra was in the bathroom. He invited Ashley into the bathroom, but he was so crass about it that he knew that that would be a turnoff to Ashley and that she would turn away. I mean, that is bold. That might be one of my favorite 
Tucker moments so far. I don't know. I, I like the idea that maybe Tucker and Audra are actually a pair and they're a couple and they're together and that everything with Ashley is just him wanting to get at Chabot. But I feel like probably Tucker does, in his mind, love Ashley, but he's got, <laughs> he's a sexual man that has sexual needs that need to be met and Audra maybe seemed to accept that. Before Ashley got there, Audra was threatening to find another job, but then hearing that Tucker was actually making progress with Ashley made Audra agree to stay with him, and he promised her a big reward that she apparently deserves once their plan, whatever it is, is complete. And if that doesn't work out, Nate offered her a job at Newman Media. I could see that happening. I can absolutely see that happening. <laughs> but Elena has already got her guard up. I mean, Elena just got rid of Imani. And now she's going to have to deal with Audra. Elena <laughs> very per was very perceptive in telling Nate that she feels Audra's always working an angle. That's a lot to infer from meeting Audra only a couple of times. But Elena is right. Audra just is quickly being popped into Imani's old shoes. Sharon, too, just like Elena, was completely over Audra. Sharon was questioning her about how long she's going to stay in town. Definitely didn't appreciate her asking questions about Noah to one of the barista, baristas. And Sharon said to Audra... Well, you know, Noah's got a sweet thing going on with Allie right now, and I don't want to see you ruin it. And Audra seemed to accept that, and she was very reassuring to Sharon that she's over Noah, and she doesn't really know what her plans for Genoa City are. <sighs> I mean, who knows? Audra could just set her eyes on a new man. I think it's a situation of be careful what you wish for, Sharon, because Audra may end up shifting her attention from Noah onto Sharon's new future boyfriend, Chance. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if Sharon's going to go for Chance. I don't know. Chance seems to only have eyes for Sharon right now. I mean, he got over Abby pretty quickly, but he really seems to be wanting to share his life <laughs> with Sharon in a way that he didn't want to open up or share with Abby. And I don't know, maybe Sharon has some kind of mystical power over men walking around in, around in those tan leather pants. Maybe tan leather pants are Chance's thing. <laughs> That's all Abby had to do to fix her marriage. Invest in a pair of leather pants. Oh, I don't know, though. I think this is a good place to put a poll question, a prediction poll question. Do you think that Chance and Sharon will become more than friends? Or, like, is this just friends? Are they going to become romantic, or is this just friends? I think that's a good prediction. Go to yrchat.com if you want to weigh in on that. Because I don't know. I, I keep getting friendship vibes but then i know that sharon does love to date the town cop she was with dylan she was with ray and now here comes chance she seems to like that um that that type of guy so even though my prediction vote goes to sharon and chance being just friends if it does become romantic i'm going to try my very best to leave myself open to it i think it's just that I'm so interested in Sharon. I love Sharon. I love seeing fiery Sharon. But Chance doesn't really excite me. I'm a little s surprised and disconnected from him that he was able to get over Abby in about two seconds flat. And also, he's just very serious. He's almost too serious. I do think... There was some good effort made this week toward giving him some oomph. His story about arresting a mall elf <laughs> was pretty funny. And I liked Sharon's reaction to it. It had her, you know, delighted. And I also really appreciated 
his moment of distaste for the Crimson Lights holiday drink special. <laughs> Every year at Christmas, we get those Christmas mugs. And he just looked at it and said, uh, no. <laughs> it tastes like a whole gingerbread house crammed into a cup. And I don't know. I just kind of like a person who drinks black coffee, doesn't need all the extra sugar. That does tell me that me and Chance may have some hope to vibe with each other in the future. Aww, Adam's gonna be a dad. <laughs> Again. Aww. That's my prediction, anyway. That twinge! Sally's having her romantic Christmas cocoa in the park with Nick, and she suddenly feels that tummy twinge. <laughs> it's Adams. <laughs> There's just no two ways about it. If it were Nick's baby, there would be no story. She would be happily ever after with Nick. She's chosen Nick. There's only drama if the baby is Adams. And here at YNR, we are in the business of drama. <laughs> oh. I mean, she could also potentially lie about the baby's paternity that's always a good one that'd be fresh <laughs> maybe she feels adam is too destructive and nick would be a better dad so she switches the paternity test results oh i mean there's lots of ways this could go but all of them predictable and all of them lead to daddy adam I mean, what a coincidence, too, that Nick and Sally were just talking about parenthood when she felt that tummy twinge. Nick was saying how important his kids are to him and how if you do your job right, you end up losing them a little. Mm, I like Nick. I love Nick. I thought that idea was painfully right on, especially as I'm raising my daughter and I realize if I do everything right, I lose her a little. Ah, so I loved that out of Nick, and I loved Sally talking more about her childhood as a family who traveled in a circus. I, you know, I think the term carny is used as a derogatory word, so I'm calling them traveling carnival workers instead. There's nothing wrong with working at a carnival. <laughs> I think carnivals are great. But Sally's parents were negligent. <clears throat> I thought it was interesting that Sally said she never went to school. That's big. I mean, I mean, I think she's probably maybe a little bit younger than me. I mean, that she would not go to school is surprising. She said she never had friends her own age and she was always feeling like she was on the outside looking in at all of the happy families who were attending this carnival and I just ah, uh, I totally felt her story I feel like gosh, <sighs> Sally Spectra, the character is the best like I love her her backstory. I love Courtney Hope. I love her style. I love that she was raised by Grams and her great aunt Sally Spectra. She, this character has legacy. This character is meaningful. This character crosses over to soaps. So why do we never see any of this? Sally could be so much more than rivalry fuel and baby bait. I want YNR to cast her sister, Coco. Give her some family. Give her some friends. Give her some cohorts. Let her be a devious little creep. Instead of trying to squeeze her into the typical leading lady box with a predictable storyline. 
Free Sally Spectra! <laughs> Free Sally Spectra! That is my Christmas wish this year! Adam and Chelsea are growing closer this holiday season. She decided to leave the warm bosom of Sharon's coffee house home and take a winter walk. And Adam saw her and followed her, and we had uh, the briefest of moments where Chelsea was standing in front of a railing, and she was looking down, presumably, at a group of Christmas carolers. And I wonder if we were all thinking, oh, oh is she thinking of jumping? Because she was kind of despondent for a moment at the coffee house. And then she said, I'm going to go for a walk. And then she's standing in front of this railing, looking down and kind of looking very contemplative. I mean, I'm sure if the camera panned out, it was probably like a three foot drop to the ground. But the fact that she was standing in front of a railing, I think we can't help thinking now about the last time we saw her alone outside. <clears throat> well, Adam made a special trip to the ranch to request that Chelsea and Connor spend Christmas with the Newmans. I thought Nikki was surprisingly open to the idea. It was shocking. She said, oh, Adam's welcome. And she was very empathetic about Chelsea being there, too. Hmm. Victor definitely threw up some resistance to the idea, and he grouched at Adam about Chelsea's misdeeds. And I thought, oh, wait a minute. I feel an amends coming on. <laughs> We're going to see Chelsea go to the Newman Christmas and make amends with Victor and Nikki, too. Is there anybody else that we can make amends to? I was just glad, though, to see Chelsea spending time with anybody other than Billy. She was with Adam and she was with Chloe, too. Esther apparently made a Christmas pastry and then sent Chloe over with it. And I really enjoyed the scene of the girls hanging around in Chelsea's apartment, eating the dessert, drinking the hot cocoa, and they were both kind of snuggled under some blankets on the couch. <sighs> yeah, I mean, it was better than, like, the constant amends parade last week. I, I thought to my, I thought, I've got, like, s literally six or seven screen caps now titled, Chelsea Makes Amends to... And then it's just all the different names of the people that she made amends to. Sharon, Adam, Billy, Chloe. I am waiting for her to go to the mall to make amends with Santa for being a naughty girl. Chelsea has a Christmas gift for Johnny. So let's have a family meeting to discuss whether or not that's okay. Okay. This situation really makes me feel conflicted because Chelsea is Johnny's biological mom. There's no erasing that. You have to accept that. You can't stick your head in the sand and pretend it's not true. And on top of that, as Billy pointed out, she's also his aunt. I don't know how that's true. <laughs> I lost track of the family trees a long time ago, but let's assume that right. that's right. Chelsea is Johnny's biological mother and also his aunt. Well, there's nothing wrong with bio mom slash aunt Chelsea wanting to give a present to Johnny on Christmas, who is also Connor's friend. Johnny's also Connor's friend. The present seems fine, but on the other hand, I think, well, did Chelsea give Johnny a present in years past as Aunt Chelsea before he knew she was bio mom Chelsea? And if not, then why do we have to make a whole thing about it now? That's, you know, like, it's all on Chelsea's timeline still. Now she wants to give a present, so we all have to make room for that. I, I, mean, I guess, you know... That part's not really Chelsea's doing. I don't know. She just said I've got a present, but she could have passed it along. Billy seems almost to be nudging Johnny and Chelsea together now. And I know logically there's nothing wrong with that, but as a mom, I can't help standing in Victoria's shoes. 
She raised Johnny. That's her son. Chelsea herself admitted last week that Johnny was conceived because of her extremely bad behavior. Drugging Billy and getting knocked up. But now that Chelsea's decided to make all these amends, now that she's decided that she's ready to own up, Victoria is expected to just go along and support the relationship. And that's the right thing to do. I would like to think of myself as someone who tries really, really hard to do what's right, especially by my kid. But if I were Victoria, I would be jealous. I know I would. I would be jealous. I'm not perfect, but I know I would. I know that would be a flaw. That would be what I would be thinking. I would probably be steering Johnny away from Chelsea. I know that's not right. It's not right. But I mean, I don't know. People are territorial. Moms are territorial over their babies. That's instinct. I guess that goes for Chelsea, too. And Chelsea's not asking to be Johnny's mom. So then, okay, now I've had this whole jealousy feeling, and then I feel bad. Because <laughs> none of this is, like, Chelsea's fault. I just, it's a, it's a good story precisely because there are multiple angles that I can consider it from. And no one's really right or wrong. It's just feelings. It's just different emotions and, and competing agendas. And then stuck in the middle is Johnny. Right. He's old enough. He's mature enough to make some decisions, but he's not old enough, not mature enough to have the life experiences that guide that decision making. And that's what a parent's job is. And as a parent, above all, you don't want your child to get hurt. I really think that Victoria is doing an exceptionally good job of keeping herself in check. I mean, I think it's better than expected and better than I would have done. She accepted that the Christmas gift exchange turned into a dinner. But she also was really honest. And she was able to admit out loud that she is worried that dinner is going to turn into more. And that before she knows it, now she's out of the picture, which is pure insecurity talking which is such a human emotion imagine that victoria newman acting like a human being i love this will the christmas miracles never cease last week i was trying to put my finger on exactly what it is about Daniel that drives the ladies crazy. And then I realized he's the son of a rock star, a bona fide arena playing, hairspray wearing rock star. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> That's it. On the nose. When Danny Romilotti is your father, with women so enthralled by him that they will switch a paternity test just to get him, well, then you just are soaking in that magnetism by proxy. <laughs> Even if it's not biological proxy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Daniel is not Danny's biological son. Daniel's childhood contained a pretty big paternity secret uh, with Phyllis. And, and, and that's another thing that uh, Daniel has in common with Lily. They had like a, you know, a, a whole paternity situation. I mean, everybody does. <laughs> in Genoa City, everybody is born with a paternity situation. <laughs> but anyway, the point is, damn, Danny looks good. <laughs> I am sure that that is his real hair color. <laughs> he does look, but he looks natural, and I mean that. He looks natural. He looks exactly like I remember him. And he arrived just in the nick of time, too. Daniel was all alone thinking about whatever happened with Heather and Lucy. 
which is the question that he's been dodging since he came back to town. And I'm kind of hoping that Danny will be able to draw it out of him. Diana got her Christmas wish this year. We actually got to see Sharon, Noah, Mariah, and Tessa decorating the coffee house. Yay! This is, I think, the second year that we had a lot of focus on that musical light-up snow globe TV. That thing was prominently featured this year. I think someone at YNR must love that thing and because last year... Nick's Christmas episode started and ended with it. I don't know if you remember that, but then this year we busted it out again and Mariah was criticizing it for its gaudiness. I don't know. I thought it was fine. But I do kind of love that somebody called Sharon out on her Christmas kitsch. <laughs> and that the whole family was involved in the conversation about Christmas style. Because some people like it simple, Mariah. Some people like it glittery, Tessa. And some people like it gaudy, Sharon. <laughs> and Noah was somewhere in between, just taking it all in, letting the girls decorate him like he was a Christmas tree. Aww. Well... Tessa accidentally let it slip that the girls are holding out hope that they'll be meeting with a pregnant mother about an adoption after the new year. And it really seems like that's going to happen. They got a text message from the girl saying that uh, that they want to meet them and a picture of the sonogram was included. But before that, Mariah was really wanting to play the whole thing close to the vest. She didn't want to tell anybody anything about it. She, I think she wanted to avoid spreading the disappointment to everyone if it didn't work out. But Tessa just kind of opened her mouth and the news fell out. And Mariah and Tessa talked a lot about their feelings around it. I'm sure that... These are all real feelings when you're going through the adoption process. You have excitement and hope and planning for the future, but you also have fear and reservation and cushioning yourself for the blow. I think Mariah um, really took to heart this year. She revealed that, you know, she had accidentally let the idea of becoming a mom make room in her brain. I mean, literally, she said that she had decorated the baby's room in her mind, and now they're in this holding pattern. There's just nothing left to do except for wait for whatever comes, be it joy or pain. Um, and I guess nothing left to do except for to dream. Um, our Christmas episode this year featured uh, what turned out to be a shared psychic dream between Mariah and Tessa that a young and very pregnant mother just sort of auspiciously blew into crimson lights from the cold and went <laughs> into labor right there on the floor where you order your latte. <laughs> uh. Not gonna lie... That The episode kind of made me uncomfortable at first because I could feel Mariah especially <laughs> eyeing this woman's belly, wondering and kind of wishing if she could just have this baby. <laughs> and it all seemed sort of self-centered and greedy. But then Tessa pulled Mariah aside and basically said, this is not about you or us. This is somebody who needs our help. So let's help her. Let's be part of her story. It's her story to write. And then as soon as Mariah relaxed, 
I started to relax and I started to enjoy the whole episode. I thought that the actress who played the mother was excellent. She was a real cutie pie. And I felt happy for her when she gave birth and she held her child and she came to the realization that everything was going to be all right and that she was going to make a good mom. (sighs) But then flashed to Mariah and Tessa and they were sad. The mother was happy, but Mariah and Tessa were sad. And that's the thing that gutted me. Someone else's happiness also contained Mariah and Tessa's sorrow. But then I started thinking back to that opening scene of the episode where Nick and Sharon were talking about Noah as a child on Christmas Eve and Christmas morning and Uh, Christian as a child this Christmas morning and how special it is to have that little bit of Christmas magic in your life as seen through your child's eyes. And then I realized, well, I have that. I have exactly that. Everything that Mariah and Tessa want, I have. My daughter's six years old and she's waking up on Christmas morning to the magic of the full tree and the love of her family. And then, you know, I felt grateful, you know. Everything Mariah and Tessa are just yearning for, fighting for, I already have it. And I'm not going to say that it was easy. Raising a child's not easy, but just getting to the point of being able to try is so much harder for Mariah and Tessa. There's just so many children out there who are not wanted and here... Mariah and Tessa's biggest Christmas wish is to just have the thing that so many people take for granted. So in that way, I really felt connected to the Christmas episode. And yeah, it made me cry. (laughs) I mean, Christmas is so often about what you want. You know, like, what do you want for Christmas? But I don't know, this Christmas, I, I... I want to spend time being happy with what I have. And that includes you, Lionar Chatters. I hope that you guys all have a very Merry Christmas. I'm going to go get to it. So here's the part where you can go to yrchat.com to Read all of the comments from the past week that I am not going to have time to read today. But you can also leave your comments about this way in our chat or anything uh, about the show. Uh, you can do that at yrchat.com. You can also go and check out the Who Said It quote, which from last week was, The more at peace you are, the more things go your way. I love that line. And it was Tucker who said it. He was talking to Phyllis, who had just been fired, and he had this piece of wisdom that I just thought was really meaningful. The more at peace you are, the more things go your way. I think that's really, really true. Um, Only five people got that right, which is pretty surprising to me, so I have to say big Christmas congrats to Daisy, Naomi, Henry, Ron, and Kamna. Very good, you guys. That was a great catch. And I do have one more for you this week. Again, it feels pretty... Related to the holidays. So here you go. It's the holidays and people do all sorts of zany things. That's the quote. It's the holidays and people do all sorts of zany things. Who do you think said that? Well, you can go to yrchat.com to leave your guess and let me know. Um, Also at the website is last week's poll question. I asked you guys if you're interested in Allie's character and story right now. I'm really pleasantly surprised to see that 55% of you are still in on Allie, the character, and Allie's story. 45% of you saying, no, not really into it. I can't help but feel that if YNR really put some effort into the Allie character, spent a little more time with her maybe this Christmas season, maybe we could turn up um, some of that around and really start to get behind the character of Allie. So that's last week's poll. You, this week's polls also at the website predicting whether or not you think that Sharon and Chance will become a romantic pairing. And now on the topic of predictions, 
next week, we are going to delve into our annual YNR predictions. So I'm going to go back through. I'm going to be busy this upcoming week going back through our predictions for 2022. And I'm going to see what came true, what was just wild and off, <laughs> what was just fun. And then next Sunday, I will put up a new post so that you'll have a chance to make your official predictions for 2023. It's like a time capsule. It's like just one of, one of my favorite things that we do here at YNR Chat. So, okay, well, I think that's it. Merry Christmas, everybody. And um, uh, I will definitely see you next week in 2023. So for the last time from 2022, I love you. Bye.